NHS is, as many of you know, is awful, not so good at treating men for low testosterone. What is the testosterone? What is the testosterone molecule? What does it do? Well, it's actually three drugs in one. There are lots of men who come to our clinic terrified of having too high of estradiol, but it's really one of the reasons why men who are low on testosterone feel so rubbish. Things happen, stress can happen, sometimes you're not sure, but if you've noticed these, these signs that, that could be possibly a reason to go have a blood test done. Does testosterone cause cancer, especially prostate cancer? I'm Mike from Balance My Hormones, and I, I'm the founder of Balance My Hormones, a, a TRT, HRT clinic in the UK. And I was the first to set up what I've always called American style, HRT, but with British and European sensibilities. Because there wasn't really a whole lot of offerings at the, at the time I started. There was a few high street doctors on Holly Street, um, but their model was very much NHS, but faster. And let me tell you, the NHS is, as many of you know, is awful. And maybe in your home countries like Sweden, etc., not so good at treating men for low testosterone, unless you're the sickest of the sick and the lowest of the low. I was gonna go into this talk about, you know, what is the testosterone? What is the testosterone molecule? What does it do? Well, it's actually three drugs in one. It's, you know, your testosterone, your free testosterone, it's your estradiol, it's your dihydrotestosterone, which are all very important. So if I was just doing a DHT analog, i.e. Primabol, then I wasn't getting the full effect of the testosterone, especially I wasn't getting any conversion to estradiol, which is really, really important. There are lots of men who come to our clinic terrified of having too high of estradiol, but it's really one of the reasons why men who are low on testosterone feel so rubbish is because their estradiol is too low. And that's one of the things that we do at our clinic as we're looking at guys and we just don't look at the testosterone level and say, okay, here's a cutoff, you're fine or you're not fine. Because sometimes if it's a bit borderline or a bit low and you also have a low estradiol level and that level is low, that plays into the story of someone having low testosterone because low testosterone is also a story of low estradiol. And then you can do further studies to look at DHT, but if the estradiol is low, more than likely you can have low DHT as well. Testosterone is obviously a molecule we all like, probably know, I mean, it's like teaching you know, Nanda suck eggs, right? You guys know testosterone is, you know, it comes from your testes. 95% of it's made in our testes. But there is, if you might not know, like a small amount, like 5% or less made from your adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. So at the time when it had really low levels, I did have a little bit of testosterone there, but I, I can't even remember the number. It was, it was, it was really, really low uh, for a man. And it was, it was probably in the US. Um, I mean, it's well under 100. It's, I think it dropped to 60 nanograms per deciliter at one point. And I was getting blood tests every couple of weeks to watch it rise, because mentally it wasn't a good, good situation to be in, having the low levels for me. And, and ironically, years later, and we were talking about genetic tests, I did a DNA screen from a company called Nebula Health. It's much better than 23andMe because you keep the data. I think only you and the Chinese know, because <laughs> I think it's a Chinese company. But it's, it's okay because you keep the data. It's not being fed off to the F, FBI or anywhere else. It said I actually have a high predisposition to high testosterone levels. I just never experienced that. And later on, I think I told you guys yesterday, one of the reasons when I pieced it all together with the knowledge I've gained over the years, what had actually happened, what well, became obvious, why my levels were lower than my father's levels, who, as I said yesterday, was you know, close to 800 at different times. And that's because I have a varicose seal, which is a bundle of veins that sit in your scrotum that, that block fertility. But yet so many doctors will gaslight you and say, no, 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 that's just for fertility. It doesn't affect the testosterone, but come on. We know that men's testosterone levels are dropping uh, over previous generations, or fertility levels are dropping, but so are the testosterone levels. And they kind of go hand in hand uh, fertility and, and much as we we're talking before about the environmental toxins, the pesticides and all these other chemicals we're exposed to, not to mention stresses of modern life. This is something that we as men will experience in one degree or another. Some of us are more robust. Some of us can, you know, but there are other factors, how we were exposed, what we we're exposed to, or even other genetic factors. But yeah, genetically, I'm supposed to have higher levels of testosterone, which brings us to the point of how do you measure the testosterone levels? And, and obviously those are done through a blood test, but how does one define what a healthy level is, or an optimal level is, versus what's you know, clinically deficient? And I, you know, I've heard, I've been to the conferences, it's a stab in the dark. Some endocrinologist group, clique of them decided, hey, this number sounds good, we're gonna use this as a cutoff. So there's one society called the British Society of Sexual Medicine, which are much more advanced than the NHS, and they'll say testosterone levels, and they're just looking at total, because as 
as I said yesterday, there's the total level and there's a free t level. And your total testosterone level is the amount that your testes are putting out total. But then there's these other proteins in the body that bind to the, some of the testosterone. And there's also uh, something called albumin that binds and, and uh, testosterone bound to albumin, bioavailable testosterone. And the one that's with uh, SHBG, what's left over is free testosterone. And everything else is kind of bound up to these, one of these two proteins. And the reason why the bioavailable is a little bit better than, than the total is because it can disassociate more easily where that one that's bound to that sex hormone binding globule is bound really tightly and it doesn't want to come apart. But there are some, there's still ongoing research about is there any relevance to the complex of the testosterone and the SHBG, some of that will get into the cells, and, but we don't know if it does anything. So the thought is the free testosterone is what counts. So most of the guidelines don't take into account that free testosterone level. So if you're a man and you're thinking, oh, well, I might need testosterone treatment, what do I do? The, the tr traditional um, cutoffs are based on total. So the British society says maybe levels of 12 and below plus symptoms, a little bit of a, hey, yeah, well, maybe you can look at the free testosterone, but they're not quite strong on that one because they're a bit afraid of the endocrinologists. So the, that's the British society. And there's a group of some urologists, some uh, GPs with a specialty in testosterone in the UK, a few endocrinologists, but not the full endocrinology society. Um, so they'll be a little bit more liberal, but the NHS, the cutoff is usually six or seven of the total, and they won't even take into account SHBG or the free. We've looked to this international symposium of um, uh, Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler, and I think there's some people out in the, in the Czech Republic. Uh, back in 2017, they came up with this general guidance. Uh, they also fall under the group, uh, the ISSAM. So it's the International Society of Aging Males. And their cutoff isn't really quite a cutoff. They have a statement in their guidance that says, we believe that Symptoms of low testosterone start as high as 15 nanomolars per liter. People will still fall above it because there's something that, that uh, that's not talked about a lot. And it's going back to their genetics. It's something called CAG repeats. Some of us are more sensitive to testosterone and some of us are less sensitive. And those of us who are less sensitive to testosterone require more testosterone. So those are usually called long CAG repeats. And others might have a very sensitive uh, part in the genome, so short CAG repeats, these little CAGs that are very close together that you can count out. I'm not a geneticist, but my one mate who is, he showed me how, how to do it on, on my test. And um, that you might not need as much testosterone or the testosterone that you get, you're gonna be more sensitive to. So what happens is you can have a man that may have still fall into the normal range, have all the symptoms of testosterone, but they might have these long CAG repeats and they might have, may have had much higher levels when they're younger, but you never know. You, you'll never know what the levels were when they're younger. And so in those situations, sometimes we have to defer to, well, it would be nice if we can get a genet genetics test, but no one will do just a small androgen receptor. That, that's where we look for the CAG repeats is the androgen receptor. I don't know if anyone knows some of, some of the symptoms of low T. We use an evaluation called the ADAMS questionnaire. So it's um, androgen deficiency in the aging male um, symptom survey. You know, some, some of the endocrinology societies will say, oh, that's, they're very much dismissive of this. But in the general field, ADAMS questionnaire is, is kind of a, a general scorecard for, for, for diagnosing. It's funny because in the, the world of psychiatry, they're not doing tests on your dopamine, dopamine and other neurotransmitters. They, I mean, it's, unless you're in research, they're not doing those. But for some reason in endocrinology, and it's probably a good thing that we have you know, biomarkers that we can look at, but in psychiatry, they just use surveys all the time to see what your mood is, and here you, here you go. So some of, the, some of the questions are, and you may have guessed it, uh, have you ever decreased in morning wood or morning erections? Uh, and, and the reason that's really tied to it, and it can also be tied to how much estradiol that you've got in relation to your testosterone, is uh, morning wood's a good indicator of both your vascular health and kind of the natural functioning of this diurnal rhythm and, and when your testosterone levels are optimal uh, enough as well. Um, so that's one of them, a decreased or lack of, of desire for libido, or low libido, low sex drive. This is clearly one. I mean, again, these are quite subjective. So you know, things happen, stress can happen. Sometimes you're not sure, but if you've noticed these, these signs that, that could be possibly a, a reason to go have a blood test done. Uh, weak erections are another one. Yeah. So you're saying you can have a good erection, but low libido. You can, yeah, yeah. You can, you can have a low, low desire, low libido. So, the, I mean, so the, you don't have to hit every single one of these, but if you have a few of them, it, it might be worth getting a test. But I've always said, even if you're the healthiest, like when you're at your healthiest point, having a blood test is a really good benchmark for the future years. Because if, especially when you're feeling really good and you're young and you're healthy, if you know what your levels are, this is something you can look at later on. Good blood tests in the 90s, you just 
you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm lucky, I, yeah. And a lot of people, they'll just jump on a cycle, not knowing, and they'll never know what goal they're going to go back to attain. Because, so, you know, because it was too tempting, because it was there, the mate gave them this. Because when I was deficient, I was like, I knew where, I start, where my starting point was. And then I was watching as if I can come back to that starting point. Yeah. And I never came back after a year to that starting point. So a couple of the other things on the survey, so weak erections, um, some things that you wouldn't even think of is like your work performance has declined. Yeah. You know, a diminishment in your ability to perform work, a, a diminishment in your performance at, at the gym or other sports that you enjoyed once that you're not quite have the energy, a general lack of energy. Falling asleep after dinner is another uh, key sign. So it must have to do with your, you know, insulin um, and your blood sugar and that's all, because that is managed through testosterone. The other one is uh, lost some height. So does anyone know why a lack of height, you get feel like you're shorter? I've got two theories why this is. So we talked about estradiol being very, very important because testosterone's three drugs in one. Well, if you're losing height, it's a good chance you've got osteopenia or osteoporosis because if you've had low testosterone for so long, as a male, I mean, usually women get this, mm -hmm. but as a male, your estradiol is dropping, you may have some bone loss. So basically, hitting menopause. Yeah, you may. Have, but if you have bone loss, you're going to get the shrinkage of the spine. You ever see like older people, like the queen, where she's kind of got shrunk, yeah, get smaller and smaller, everyone gets smaller when they get older, loss of muscle mass and, and loss of bone density. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something to. Uh, to be aware of, and that's why they say decrease in height. And I've also thought, likened it to maybe, because you're more hunched over, you have kind of lack the confidence, but I think more biologically, it's due to having the low estrogen. So those are kind of the key ones to look out for. Sometimes there's an increase in abdominal fat as well to look out for, but that's also a sign and symptom of low uh, growth hormone levels as well. Uh, so testosterone, it can also be considered a longevity uh, molecule. So there are, there are some kind of weak studies that say testosterone may increase this thing called telomerase. Do you guys know what telomerase is? So telomerase is an enzyme that helps uh, strengthen the length of the telomeres. And these are the, the uh, um, think of it like a shoelace and the caps of your shoelace. That's what, uh, the, the cap your chromosomes. As we get older, you get less and less of this cap, and before you know it, it's just eating into the, the length of your chromosome. So as that shortens, so does your health span shorten. And so the thought is, can we lengthen or keep healthy, young-looking uh, telomeres? Biological age. And, and so this is part of the aging process. Well, some uh, studies show that testosterone may help improve telomerase. It's probably not a massively strong way of doing it. And there are some studies that I think there's a paper in Nature that came out that's talking about some other uh, small molecules that may actually lengthen or increase your telomerase. The worry is, and, and we've been talking about this since the 90s. I remember telomerase. I don't know if you do, uh, Alan that this was going to be the holy grail of anti-aging, but like everything in medicine and research, they get very worried about anything that may push it to growth and cancer. Mm -hmm. And so anything that has to grow, speed up cancer. But the fact is, you know, if you're, you know, your food, blood, blood growth food, speeds up cancer, you, you know, sugar can increase yeah. cancer, you know, your own blood supply does. So, you know, and that's why they have these medications that block the growth of, of blood vessels sometimes in, in cancer. But anything can cause it, but I don't think that's, or anything could help it, doesn't mean it's going to cause it. And, and a lot of people, and maybe in your own minds, there's a thought, does testosterone cause cancer, especially the, you know, the scary one for men is prostate cancer. And, you know, there's been some studies done lately, and, and one of the leading researchers, Abraham Morgenthaler from Harvard University, you know, he's come up with what's called the saturation model. And there's some further studies that have come out that said, yes, there is a link between testosterone and prostate cancer. And the link is this, those men with the lowest levels of testosterone are at the greatest risk of malignant forms of prostate cancer. Okay. To me, it always makes sense that a teenager doesn't get prostate cancer. An old man with low testosterone gets prostate cancer. If you have prostate cancer, after all the diagnosis, the MRIs, the biopsies, and they find out you have prostate cancer, uh, they do um, androgen ablation therapy is one of them. And they'll try to, sometimes they'll try to target the cancer, you know, with some kind of, um, I think it's all like radiation, or they'll do some of these, like the beam treatments and the, uh, or some sort of radiation or even targeted chemo, and then, or, or remove some of the gland, which is then kind of leaves you incontinent and, and the impotent. That's Armstrong. Yeah, well, like a full prostatectomy is like the one to, and some guys say, okay, I don't want that. Or they'll do a um, kind of watch and wait, you know, an uh, observation. But generally speaking, if they go to the stage where uh, they do full ablation, ablation of your androgens. They're giving you everything they can to suppress your androgens as low as possible. And so for a while it works, because in the studies they'll say, okay, well, okay, now you know, the, the tumor's gone, the PSA's gone back down to normal or hardly detectable, everything is fine. 
But then on the average of five years later, maybe a bit longer if a man's lucky, it comes back. So why does it come back? So they'd started studies of doing a combination of ablation therapy and then giving high dose testosterone. Mm. And they found that would shrink the tumor. So there's still a lot that they, they don't know. There's also a component with prolactin, and that's another hormone we didn't talk about. Prolactin is important for women who are um, producing milk and lactating, but for men, you don't need a whole lot of it. And sometimes um, SSRIs, uh, proton pump inhibitors, so if you had acid reflux disease, et cetera, you'll give, be prescribed a proton pump inhibitor. These can raise your prolactin level. Testosterone treatment itself can raise prolactin levels. Uh, testosterone treatment that turns in, uh, converts into high, dose, high levels of estradiol can raise prolactin levels. Stress can raise prolactin levels. SSRIs, some antidepressants can raise prolactin levels. Mm -hmm. Certain supplements can raise prolactin uh, levels. Anything that would probably be more estrogenic can, could raise it. So ejaculation could raise prolactin levels. Right. Lack of sleep sometimes. Mm -hmm. Melatonin, melatonin is one that can raise prolactin levels in some men if you're sensitive to it. It's usually transient, but it, it can raise it. So when you do a blood test, uh, that, can, that can happen. So anyway, prolactin can uh, basically kill a man's sex drive and it, it works opposite of dopamine. And the beauty of testosterone is it can also enhance your dopamine, which is why men that start testosterone, you get this sudden rush of, of dopamine, especially from the injections. Uh, and dopamine is what we all, all want. And, and as we get older, uh, we, we get less and less of it due to the, I think I mentioned yesterday, the MO, MAOB enzyme that kind of gobbles up all your dopamine from keeping it around long enough. So it turns out, I think testosterone is a, a mild MAOB uh, inhibitor and, and a bit stronger on the MAOA. So basically it helps preserve serotonin as well as keeping some dopamine around a bit longer. When dopamine is low, prolactin is high. After ejaculation, you know, dopamine goes down, prolactin goes up. So it's, it's not a nice one. So anyway, the prolactin and prostate cancer, they found that if they can use drugs to lower prolactin, they might also help uh, especially for guys who have done all the androgen ablation and it's not working, they may have future drugs that come out that will just suppress the prolactin. Bodybuilders who have used the Tren or the Deca would use something called Cabergoline. Some of our patients who use a small dose of Caber, which will um, boost dopamine and, um, and lower prolactin. So people who have a prolactinoma, that's the other reason why, sorry, I forgot, completely forgot the most obvious reason why you would have high prolactin is a prolactinoma. So that's a benign tumor that grows in the brain. And some people are more prone to, women are more prone to this as well when they're on the cabergoline or one of the other um, uh, dopamine agonists, right? <laughs> uh, cool. Thank you guys, thank you. <laughs> if you found this video helpful, don't forget to watch our other videos on topics around HRT and TRT. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And until next time, stay in good health. This is Mike from Balance My Hormones.